Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. This is TQ 1089 to 1103. Therapy quote number 1089. In every nursery there are ghosts, visitors from the unremembered past of the parents. While no one has issued an invitation, the ghosts take up residence and conduct the rehearsal of the family tragedy from a tattered script. The effects, the effects of the inheritance of intergenerational and historical trauma are palatable, but often indescribable. They are at once present and unknown. Hans Lowald famous, famously characterized the work of, anal of analysis as the work of turning, quote, ghosts into ancestors. So this is one of the threads in this series, uh, the idea of intergenerational trauma. So the, the main uh, uh, thread adopted so far on, on this topic is that it's based on the transmission of an insecure attachment style. If the, the, the daughter doesn't receive a secure attachment style from her mother, when she grows up, she doesn't know how to offer it to her children. And then likewise, those children grow up and then don't know how to offer it Okay, and so on. So that's a form of intergenerational trauma because when there's an insecure attachment style, the person is repeating the trauma of the insecure attachment style. Okay. Um, so Bowlby says uh, uh, we either have a secure attachment style uh, or an insecure attachment style. The secure attachment style, Mahler says, uh, that leads to whole object relations, the psychological birth, ontological security, a sense of self, the plumb line comes to the self. Masterson says that uh, once you have whole object relations, then you have access to the real self, which is a part of the person with various capacities, capacity for intimacy, capacity, the capacity to know one's unique individual wishes, the capacity to feel that it's okay to uh, self-activate, and uh, and others right but with the insecure attachment style that takes place when the frustrating memories with the mother outweigh the loving memories okay then the child uh is stuck there because if it's too painful he's overly attached to the painful rejecting mother the theory is the more rejecting the mother is the more the baby needs the mother therefore the more he clings to the mother the more he gives of his uh living life force his uh Prana, his chi, his uh, uh, ilan vate, his, his life force, he, mo the more of it he gives to the rejecting image of the mother in his psyche. Right? And that means now the rejecting image can't be accepted. He has to reject it. Right? But, it's, but he's connected to it, but he's not aware of it. So there's, that's what's called the splitting defense mechanism. The child just thinks he's bonded to the loving side of the mother, but when, re when really he's more attached to the rejecting side of the mother. Now this insecure attachment style takes different forms, the narcissistic pattern, the codependent pattern, the hostile provocative attachment style, that's that schizoid pattern, uh, and symbiotic care disorder, and, and a few others. And that's a developmental trauma. That means they didn't achieve the psychological birth. The main emotions are, uh, the codependent, you know, they're always uh, desperate longing and clinging and uh, a little emotional because they can't get uh, the love they need to achieve a psychological birth, but they have this exaggerated hope for it. The narcissistic pattern, uh, they identify with the aggressor. Um, that's the I'm okay, you're not okay position, as covered in recent videos. You know. Uh, the schizoid one detaches their emotional needs, you know. And then whenever there's a insecure attachment style, it's very painful, as covered in the last video, last couple of videos, 
uh, on repetition compulsion. Another thread in this series, repetition compulsion. The person tries to recreate, relive, reenact the childhood pain with others in the present to try to get another chance at being able to master the pain. Right? It doesn't work. It can't be done after the age of five. No one in the present can uh, be that parent, that the, the person's parent of when they were a baby. No one can travel back in a time machine and redo all that. But that's sort of the positive intention. So the idea is to be aware of it and, and so on, rather than just repeat it. Either we repeat and don't remember, or we talk and remember. Right? So this whole idea about ghosts, you know, that's uh, he's he's talking about it from the point of view of the parent not getting the love they needed to offer a secure attachment style. So that kind of <laughs> the child picks up some of the memories of the traumatized parent, and these memories are like ghosts, you know, that kind of thing. So if you healed, if you forgive the parents, then the ghosts become ancestors, or a support system. Anyway, just a little follow-up on intergenerational trauma, one of the threads in this series. Okay, um, in general, psychoanalysis explores how people make sense of their lives by building and maintaining life histories that furnish, that furnish a sense of coherence, integrity, and goodness. For example, the repression of trauma is an attempt to edit the life narrative to protect the person from feeling that he is bad. Okay, so the person may have a conscious narrative of who he is, that's his conscious self. But when we say know thyself, know the conscious self and know the unconscious self, that trauma he's denying, that's part of his unconscious self. And uh, it affects a person. That, that insight that the unconscious self or the stranger within, right? Robert Bly says, uh, he quotes one poet, he, he, his metaphor is, uh, the, the poet's metaphor is that uh, there's someone who's not like me, but who walks with me, but who is me. Or, um, and and we, we've had a few metaphors about this second self, the shadow soul, the stranger, um, or the Someone even called it the skeleton, the inner child of the past, right? uh, the alter ego, the shadows, right? and so on. So this uh, unconscious uh, self um, can influence us, can influence us. That's humanity's third nar narcissistic injury, this idea about it. And uh, this next one relates to that as well. 1091, parental failures are seen as intolerable to the child and trigger the splitting defense. Again, when something's intolerable, intolerable, too painful, okay, then the splitting defense kicks in, which isolates through repression or disassociation the frustrating aspects of the parent, the object, along with the part of the self's ego that relates only to that part object. This fundamental defense protects the child from the knowledge that he is dependent on indifferent objects and preserves his attachment. The split off part self and part object structures are too disruptive, disruptive to remain conscious, yet despite being repressed, make themselves known through repetition compulsions and transference. It's a very good book by Solani. A very good introduction to object relations theory is uh, David Solani's book called uh, Fair Baron's Object Relations Theory. Excellent book. Excellent book. It's got a, uh, it's got a reddish cover. Uh, on the cover there's a, you know, you know those dolls where there's a doll inside a doll? Those Russian toy dolls? Is the babushka, babushka, babushka or something? I forgot what it's called. You know, you open the doll, there's another doll inside, and you open that doll, there's another doll inside. So, it's a nice toy, right? Um, that's a very good book, David Salani. I very highly recommend it. I'm going to nominate it for a Golden Windmill Mind, uh, a Golden Windmills of the Mind Award, but we haven't issued it yet, but I'm just going to, 
consider it. It's a, it's a, it's a very good book. So we we, we have seven uh, golden windmills of the mind uh, awards issued already. So that might be one. So we'll we'll see. But it's an excellent book. Whether it gets the award or not, it's an it's an excellent book. So anyway, see, this is a good quote here. Uh, so remember, in the endopsychic structure described a couple of days ago, right? you have the cluster of memories of the mother being loving. These memories condense. It becomes an image, imago, a fantasized personification. So in a fairy tale or myth, that would be a goddess or a good fairy godmother. Linked to a part self, representation that's loved. Right. Now, in the reject on the rejecting side, right, the same thing happens on the frustrating side. But the frustrating side of the mother that gets denied. Now, now the frustrating side of the mother has like a little mind of its own. This little mind of its own is the child's own ego, and there's a relationship there. That's what he's saying. And you don't want to be aware of all this. Now, how does it make itself known? This ghost. How does it? Okay, through the repetition compulsion through the transference, through the projections, right? through the acting out that the person doesn't know about, through the emotional eating, the person doesn't know why he's emotionally eating, those kinds of things. So it's there. Right? Uh, a little follow-up on uh, Kohut's jargon here. Okay, the self-object. An object that a person experiences as incompletely separated from himself and that serves to maintain his sense of self again a self object is an object okay that a person so in other words the mother okay the, whom the child experiences as incompletely separated from himself and it serves to maintain a sense of self so this just goes back to the fusion after birth, the baby thinks he's one with the mother. He even thinks maybe the theory is that the mother is sort of an extension of him. The theory about that is when the baby was in the womb, he, he doesn't have a sense that he's in his mother's womb. He just thinks it's all about him. Oceanic oneness, he's one with everything. He comes out of the womb, and that's because humans come out of the womb too early. He still has that thought. So now he's, his mother's holding him. He thinks he's sort of still in the womb in a way, and he... Uh, and he, as an extension, he thinks that the mother, the breast mother, is serving him, part of him. So this serving him, part of this, that's serving him, that's called a self-object. Now, if there's trauma there, that's the narcissistic pattern. They go through life thinking others are there to serve them. Yeah. So the jargon is self-object. Interesting about this next quote here, sometimes... The therapist is uh, corrupt. When he gets a client, the therapist turns the client into a self-object for him. Self-object countertransferences in which the analyst experiences the client as a part of himself. That's not a healthy thing at all. But uh, someone made the point earlier that some... Many people or some people with a narcissistic pattern are drawn to the profession of the therapy profession. So they get their certificate or whatever, just so they can have people come to them, give them money. And he sits, they, they sit back and enjoy the symbiotic fusion in his unconscious fantasy that this other person is paying him attention, mirroring him, thinking he's important. That's what the mother was supposed to do for the baby. Now he's getting his clients to do it to him. So that, that guy is severely, severely... Uh, narcissistic to do that and highly indifferent and I guess you could say the positive intention is he, he's caught in the repetition compulsion of trying to get his mother to uh, see him actually burglar would say if he's doing that he's trying to say look uh, mother see how uh, how I lie to people to get people to be nice to me that's what I wanted you to do for me but he's doing this in his mind right. what's the theory about that so that's another thread in this series, this concept of the self-object. Uh, okay, uh, okay, another thread is this uh, concept of condensation. Okay, religious stories operate by 
condensing and telescoping panhumic, sorry, panhuman concerns tied to childhood. Again, okay, religious stories or fairy tales and myths and dreams and operate by condensing and telescoping pan-human concerns tied to childhood. I thought that was an interesting quote there. Um, so condensation means uh, like in a dream, many things come together, like in a quilt. Um, um, so even sometimes even uh, several elements come together to, in one scene. In a fairy tale, things are very compact and dense. Many fairy tales are very rich. Like every every sentence has a, has a whole has a whole, has a whole motif you know, in it. Like there's a they're very so it's con condensation. That's the theory about the unconscious. It, it it can do that. It can take something from your childhood, something from the present, something you saw on TV, and something you read in a book, and it can put it all together in one little scene. It can condense things like that. Like that. Fairy tales do they miss it? Okay, religious stories similar. The theory about that is that uh, okay, I have a confession. I'm debating with myself whether or not to start a thread on the psycho, the psychoanalytic perspective of religion. I do have a collection of quotes on it. I haven't posted any of them yet on the psychoanalytic perspective on religion because uh, I'm still conflicted about whether or not to, you know. Make a video about them or just leave it in the quotes collection if you order the quotes collection you can read them but they're not posted on in the youtube uh, psychoanalytic quotes uh, youtube channel but uh, they're available in the 1001 windmills of the mind you know um, send out if you make a if you make a donation so this quote is i'm not talking about religion in this story but i just i just included to to as an example of the idea of condensation, right? Because in a religious story, there I'm sure there are a lot of motifs condensed into one package, you know, and it's, there's a lot of appeal there. And um, you know, one author said that when the when the writers of these religious books got together, they were focusing on these unconscious appeals, the universal cons universal human concerns tied to childhood. Okay. They were focused on that. Then they would change whatever superficial story or historical element. They didn't care about that. The, the primary concern was to preserve the appeal to the childhood, con to the concern of the child within. Right. So it's it's kind of similar to what a fairy tale does and what a dream does and what a po a, a poem does. That yeah, one person uh, who is it? Oh, Tacy. He says that he has a chapter called. Uh, Religion as uh, unconscious poetry. Religion as unconscious poetry. It's a similar idea, poetry and dreams. The primary process thinking, how the child thinks before words. It's the pre-verbal thinking. Right? We have a lot of trauma there, so we want to address these early traumas. Right? Okay, so we'll have more on uh, condensation. Um, I, 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 really, I, I really feel a part of me really would like to post out the quotes on the psychoanalytic perspective on religion. There's some really good quotes on it. You know, one one guy says, oh my God, just understand why people are interested in religion. And then you can understand yourself and, and we'll have a lot of healing that, that way. He said, I think he directly said, if you understand why a person likes if you understand why, if we understand why people like religion, we understand ourselves. He was very direct about it. I, I mean, I'm misquoting him, but something to that effect. And um, I've got quotes from a, a variety of sources. It's a. I didn't realize it was, that it's a huge. It's a huge sub branch within the psychoanalytics literature. This uh, perspective on uh, religion. Yeah, I'm tempted to jump into the topic, but uh, you know the most important thing is uh, we had a quote earlier. We have to respect the defense mechanisms first, so defense before content. So we always want to acknowledge our defense mechanisms. So of course, religion is a defense 
mechanism. So I'm already starting, right? And then, but you want to respect that. You want to acknowledge that's a defense mechanism. So self-help quote might say, uh, what would happen if you didn't uh, follow this uh, dogma or whatever? What are you afraid would happen or something like that? You know, those kind of... So again, I'm, uh, I hesitate again. So um, maybe in the future, if you stick with me uh, in this, um, there, there may be uh, a thread on the psychology of um, the psychoanalytic take on religion um, there's got there there must be about a good 20 30 solid quotes on it Andy uh, Thompson has I've got quotes from him he's got a book called why we believe in God God and or gods in bracket God or gods why we believe in God or gods he's got some good things in there um, a guy named Haas has some good things to say about it, interesting things. Yeah. And a couple of others. Actually, he, he uh, this guy here, what's his name? Beit Halami, is it? Is that right? Hold on. Okay, it's uh, Bet or Beit, and then it's uh, Halalmi. Is that it? Halami or something? Sorry for mispronouncing it. Uh, he he has uh, he did an interesting thing. He um, he tried he tried to summarize uh, other people's efforts uh, of uh, their thoughts on uh, the psychoanalytic perspective of um, religion. So I've got a few of his quotes. This guy here as well. So we'll see. We'll see. In the meantime, uh, one on narcissism. Okay, TQ 1095. As a defense against early frustration, the grandiose self is formed. I thought that was a very succinct way of saying it. As a defense against frustration. Okay, so uh, Kernberg says uh, you have the hungry, enraged part self or the self-hate and when you're not when the baby's not being loved as a defense against all this shame and humiliation the baby creates in his fantasy a grandiose self idealized image right so um, Karen Hornai calls that the idealized image right? and, um, so it's this uh, or the false self or so that's the birth of it. So why do we have the false self? It's a defense mechanism against the pain of being unloved. Right? So it's the superiority complex as a defense against the inferiority complex. The inferiority complex is the pain. The superiority complex is, a, is the imaginings against the pain. Right? Yeah. Okay, uh, next one. Okay, why uh, the fear and contempt for the poorest people out there? Quote, because the poor reflect our own self-image minus the ornaments. That was an interesting way of saying it. Um, actually, earlier today we had a, or no, yesterday we had a quote about, uh, we started a threat, a day or two ago, we started a thread on why people feel indifference or even contempt or lack of care about the, the plight of people in other countries who are really having a hard time. Uh, it's hard to think about. And one, one uh, suggestion was, is it linked to hatred of the siblings? And then it gets transferred. And so if you heal the relationship with your siblings, Maybe that'll, that'll improve. Um, so this one says, well, you don't want to see how you feel. If, the, if people are having a hard time, that kind of represents yourself and how you feel, minus the ornaments that we have, right? Um, interesting idea. So if we feel... Uh, so like the previous quote says, a defense against early frustration. 
early frustration, that would feel like a kind of inner poverty. So now we don't want to see outer poverty because that's how we feel. It's a simple, it, there's something there. It's, it's, you know, when you, if I say it like that, it sounds too simplistic, but th th there's something in that realm going, taking place. So we'll follow up on that. Okay, next one, interpretation. Interpretation brings the power of the cognitive apparatus into the shadowy and conflicted areas of mental life. Not only is the client thus enabled to think about what previously was unthinkable, was driving him without awareness, or was unnerving him, but he learns through the non-judgmental, matter-of-fact verbalizations of the therapist that such matters of the mind are knowable to others and thus not uniquely, disturbingly one's own, and that they need not be cause of condemnation, fear, or personal rejection. Yeah, he's saying if the, if the therapist can articulate it and he's calm about it and not judgmental, oh, that's a huge relief to be seen and understood. Right? Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. So this shows, the interpretation shows the caring. I like that though. Interpretation brings the power of the cognitive apparatus. There's a, the ego, right? Into the shadowy, conflicted areas of mental life. That's another way of, a fancy way of saying, make the unconscious conscious. Make the unbewused conscious. So again, that's with the, the cup and the, and the spring water. Okay, next one here. Neurotic clients' behavior often assume a repetitive character with unconscious symbolic significance to their acts. So I like that phrase, with unconscious symbolic significance to their acts. So the emotional eater, there's an unconscious symbolic significance to eating emotionally, you're not physically hungry. We're only supposed to eat if we're physically hungry. Why are people eating if they're not physically hungry? There's a, okay, so there's an unconscious symbolic significance to it. The food is, you know, sweet, sweetness, you know, sweetness. Every child needs sweetness and tenderness. Didn't get it. Now he eats sweetness in the present. So the sweetness, the sugary foods are symbolic of the lack of sweetness or the sweetness he needed. Burglar would say, the person's eating sweetness to say to his mother, look, mother, uh, I needed sweetness from you. I'm not getting it. I'm showing you. Something like that. Um, okay. Uh, this next one here, this next quote basically says, sometimes the therapist doesn't have to always provide an interpretation. He can just maybe make an empathetic statement confirming for the client that certain events were unintended byproducts of poor parenting for example quote your father didn't allow sorry quote your father did allow your mother to abuse you and you paid a heavy price for that It's just a simple uh, reflection. There's no interpretation. He's just saying, yeah, you know, you were abused by one parent and the other parent allowed it. Just validate that. Your, your father did allow your mother to abuse you and you paid a heavy price for that. That can be, that's very helpful, you know, sometimes. So he was saying sometimes it's okay to make a kind of supportive, empathetic comment. That not everything has to be uh, transference interpretation or what's called a complete interpretation or a total interpretation or even a vertical interpretation. It can be just a kind of a, um, a witnessing of what the person's saying. See, that would be the Chacosta mother, right? The Chacosta mother is abusing the child and then the Laius father is indifferent. So the Laius father doesn't care, right? So he's saying something like that. 
Yeah, that, yeah. We had a quote about that. What one uh, one quote was uh, how fathers are so convinced that they don't know anything about the health of their children, and they just hand it all over to the mother. Um, and he 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 says that that should be questioned a little bit. Okay, uh, next one here. Helping the client come to terms with the re realities of his past, that it may not have been as good as he wished it to be, or that it was better than he had been able to take advantage of for reasons of inner conflict, and thus promoting the painful process of acceptance of one's family and of oneself, as a product of history, which is surely one part of personal wisdom. If uh, those who do not study history, okay, here meaning reality, are condemned, oh yeah, if those who don't study history are condemned to repeat it as the saying goes, the study of it is first and foremost the recognition and objectification of what it was. I have uh, with clients again and again seen how a confirmation of aspects of their painful reality permit them to discard reality and or hypocrisy especially about the parents to get in touch with affect and or to increase their trust in their own judgment and reality sense quote it is hard for you to let yourself believe that X happened. You are showing me that X happened by making it happen again and again with your family and with me. So that last part there is the repetition compulsion. The therapist says, you are showing me what happened in your childhood by repeating, by reenacting it here in the present with me and you're doing it with your family as you're telling me. Right? So you just want to acknowledge the, the reality of the history he's saying here. It is hard for you to let yourself believe that X really happened. That's just another example of just an empathetic comment to bolster the client's sense of his ability to identify reality. Okay, uh, just a couple of more here. Okay, the real self will seem like a phantom, she wrote unless we are, quote, acquainted with the later phases of analysis or a possible self, what we can become if we are, quote, freed of the crippling shackles of neurosis. So these two authors are quoting Karen Horney. She's very poetic, Karen Horney. Um, so she's one of our mentors in this series. Althea Horner and uh, Bernard Paris uh, are quoting uh, Karen Horney in this quote. So they're saying, in the beginning, what's the real self? They don't know what the real self is. But towards the end of analysis, right, they get a glimpse of who they can be. That's the possible self, she calls it. That's moving towards the real self. Right? And a nice quote. Okay, just end on a... Okay, this next one just uh, on, on the light on the lighter side here. The favorite joke is not always connected with a client's problem. On many occasions, it may merely be a joke that was heard and repeated with success. The reward is what makes the joke a favorite, and not its personal meaning. Okay, so person's favorite joke. Traditionally, there's insight about what's going on, but sometimes a favorite joke, it just means he has success telling it. So that's why it's his favorite, not because it relates to some inner unconscious conflict. You know? uh, so for example, uh, one of my lighthearted favorite jokes, <laughs> very simple, it's a kid's joke. What's 5Q plus 5Q? You're welcome. Did you get it? What's 5Q, the letter Q, plus 5Q? You got it. Okay, you're welcome. Um, 
Okay, uh, another favorite joke is that we can all live like nomads, where I nomad at you and you nomad at me. So that's one, of, yeah, that's one of the threads we have in this series, the psychology of humor. Um, the first part, there's tension, and when you, get, when you get the second part of the joke or the punchline, you know you get the answer, and it's that contrast that makes the, makes the humor. Right? So it's called the benign violation a theory of humor. The first part is a benign violation of your expectations. You're confused. Knock, knock, who's there? You're confused. Then you get the answer. It's some wordplay. Oh, you get, now you feel safe. Remember, tension, then you feel safe. Then that's, that's the theory of humor. Right? So, a lot of, so you can notice that with a lot of humor. A comedian will tell a joke. You're a little confused. You're a little tense, maybe. But it's, it's benign. It's not. And then you realize she meant it in some other way. Oh boy, wasn't that clever of her to, and this other thought that she has means everybody's safe. So the second part of the joke means everybody's safe, right? And then we, we laugh. The laughing represents the discharge of the, of the previous tension. Okay, the last one here, uh, a little bit about empathy. So let's just end on empathy here. Okay, frenzy shows the importance of the vulnerable dimension in all of us, okay, the inner child in all of us, suggesting that recognizing mutual vulnerability is a basis of the sense of connectedness and solidarity with the other. So we always uh, feel closer to people when we, when we uh, see their, their wounds or their inner child kind of thing. Unless the person's a say, you know, severely uh, traumatized and it bothers them. Generally, generally speaking, uh, um, you know, the recognition that we all have an inner child of the past, the recognition that we all are caught in our existential dilemma, the recognition that we were all, came, we all came out of the womb too early. We all, many of, a lot of us had birth trauma, uh, or some kind of situational trauma afterwards, or some kind of. Some people have school shock, what they call school shock, kind of trauma. A person that doesn't learn well afterwards just because of the school shock. They weren't prepared for, to, for going to school. The, the fearful separation anxiety with the mother in this new place. And maybe there was a heartless, or impatient teacher. And various factors combined all together, the child experienced school shock. And he's disassociated, then he spent the next whatever, 19 years daydreaming in school, it doesn't, because he hasn't resolved that, you know, it doesn't get resolved. Or, um, you know, there's uh, trauma at the dentist's office, trauma while getting our tonsils out, you know, there's, um, yeah, there's other kinds of trauma, forced relocation, you know, um, yeah, all those uh, children who were uh, taken away from their homes during the, the 60s, very sad story. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, or um, in any kind of forced relocation kind of situation. Um, so this series is not talking, again, as mentioned before, this series is not going to look at, um, the, the focus of this series is let's heal ourselves and then things in the outside world can calm down. When, when we calm down inwardly, uh, we'll be more realistic in our thinking. Uh, we'll, right? If we find our humanity, then we're more humane to others and things like that and so on. Um, so we got to heal the narcissist. We have to understand the narcissistic pattern, the schizoid pattern, the bully pattern, the hostile provocative attachment style. A lot of these these angry patterns, uh, these, these, this is stress on stress from the repetition compulsion. And then the amygdala enlarges, literally, apparently. I didn't know that. Then the person's more sensitive, more irritable, more angry. Now, their main emotions of hate, greed, and envy, spite, vindictiveness, that it, it increases. You know, so it's a, we have to understand these things, you know, then give ourselves compassion. Um, 
So every baby is vulnerable. We have to recognize that. So um, someone called it um, Ubuntu. We find our hu humanity um, in the recognition of each other's humanness, you know, that kind of thing. Frenzy shows the importance of the vulnerable dimension in all of us, the importance of the inner child of the past. So that's like the unconscious as well, right? Recognizing that, uh, suggesting that recognizing mutual vulnerability, in other words, how everyone is basically, we're all walking wounded, put it that way. Let's, 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 let's see that and then we'll calm down. We don't, we don't need to project the unconscious memory of the mo frustrating mother onto non-threatening substitute others and then, and then they have to protect themselves from the projection and that triggers them maybe, then they are going to project the frustrating, their frustrating memories of the mother onto others and there's you have this cycle thing. Then, then the, the two sides, the amygdala is enlarging on both sides. So we don't want the amygdala, to, the amygdala to keep now that movie, that comedy movie's right. It is hard to pronounce that word. <laughs> the first Golden Windmill of the Mind Award was awarded to the comedy film Bob, Bob and His Enlarged Amygdala. It's about a half an hour long. It's a comedy film. Uh, they have a they have a thing called EAS, Enlarged Amygdala Syndrome, when Bob was able to reduce or shrink. So, you know, the, the word shrink, maybe, maybe it relates to that, right? Not just shrink your grandiosity, shrink your false self, shrink your uh, narcissism, or shrink your, uh, um, what was it again? Um, as a defense against, oh, grandiosity, shrink your grandiosity. Maybe it also means shrink the amygdala, when you calm down. Huh? Um, so yeah, uh, in that in that film, comedy film, Bob and his enlarged amygdala, they have a thing called EAS. And when Bob was uh, able to reduce his amygdala, it's a comedy, it's fiction. But anyways, the idea, it's educational, right? The idea was that then he became reasonable, intelligent. And he has a great answer about religion. So he, he, after he shrunk his amygdala, he was interviewed. Someone asked him, well... What do you think about religion? And he said, uh, "Well, it's uh, yeah, just uh, magical thinking, imaginary friends, you know." <laughs> um, and he said a couple of other things too. Um, he compared it to uh, supplements, you know. Supplements, you know, they're maybe harmless, and, uh, at best harmless, he said. Or but sometimes maybe they they have a reverse effect that can be harmful. So religion is like those uh, supplements, you know. It's it's pushing something out that's not natural kind of thing. You know. Anyways, um, yeah, again, I'm, st I'm, fl I'm still flirting with this idea whether or not to, uh, see, and this, this is my first time, this is my first video where I'm thinking out loud about whether or not to include this uh, thread about the psychology of uh, the psychoanalytic perspective of religion or the psychology of religion. So I'm, 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 in the process of processing it myself, talking to you, if anyone's listening, <laughs> whether or not to include this uh, this thread, because I don't want. You see, remember, the therapy is you have to respect the defense mechanisms first. For many people, religion is a defense mechanism. They use that to deal with anxiety. It's a it's a teddy bear, right? Religion is a teddy bear. It's a comforter, right? Um, so you don't want to just rip. You know, then maybe they have to let go of the teddy bear on their own time. Okay. So, by the way, this this is all not. This is all for um, all these videos are for adults, by the way, yeah, for information. So um, that's just a tiny. That's just. Uh, that was just that teddy bear comment. That was just reference to one part of one author's quote on. So there's more to it, but I, I don't want to reduce it that much. Um, there's a whole body of literature in it, and you have to take the whole body of literature 
You have to take these 50, 100 quotes on the psychology of religion to get that kind of gestalt feeling of what, this, what the psychology of religion means, what the, where they're coming from with that. Um, yes, it, it, yes, the common thread is that it keeps people kind of in that child state, um, you know, rescue fantasies and um, imaginary friend, you know, uh, keeps you... Um, it prevents you from uh, thinking for yourself, and um, but there's a positive intention. You see, rituals long ago. Haas makes this point. Rituals long ago, song, dance, storytelling, rituals were just to deal with anxiety. Yeah. Now, religion is sort of an extension of it, but something happened with all these creeds and dogma. Something got amplified artificially, and then. It overstimulated the brain, then it created the splitting defense mechanism. So ironically, religion created the splitting defense mechanism because then you have uh, this God is better than that. Or, you see, spirituality is to heal the splits, but religion actually creates the splits. So there's one part of one quote on this thread, right? Uh, spirituality is to heal the splits, to achieve the psychological birth. So this, this concept of spirituality is, is, is always assumed and embedded in the healing process and right? soul repair process. Um, speaking of soul repair, maybe, uh, maybe we'll end on the song Soul Surgery. This is a, a cover version, somebody's a cover version of the song Soul Surgery, Open Soul Surgery, originally by April Wine. Uh, the band Prism um, did a cover rendition of it. So here's a live uh, rendition of Open Soul Surgery uh, by Prism. Not a bad song uh, by the original singer, Ron Tayback was the original singer. He's just talking about, um, you know, he's heartbroken with a girl or something. Now he needs open soul surgery. He just means it that way. But the title of the song, you know, I thought I could include it in this collection here. Um, and he says, help me now. So now. So he said, yeah, he said he's lost, right? He fell in love with high, his high school sweetheart. Now he's wandering lost and confused, that kind of thing. But you know, this kind of uh, intense romantic love, you know, that's called transference love, right? So we, we have a thread on transference love. The difference between love, the mutuality, and transference love. You transfer your needs, self-object needs, for mirroring, comfort, onto a present. And yesterday's video about endopsychic structure, we have the tantalizing other representation and the tantalized self. So if a person projects the tantalizing representation, 
If they project that unconscious image, the imago, onto someone else, in this case, he did it to his girlfriend there or whatever, uh, then she becomes emotionally equivalent to how the baby needed his mother's comfort and care. So there's a real strong, and a lot of life force is attached to the rejecting image of the mother. So a lot of, a lot of his emotionality is attached to the woman. So that's why if she rejects him later on, it, it really feels like a, it, it's painful that way, right? It's very stressful. Okay, so we've, uh, so, okay, so we've, uh, in this video, we covered a uh, TQ 10, uh, 89. So again, all the, all of the quotes beyond 1001 are bonus quotes. So this is part of the bonus quotes material. But again, if anyone orders the, the collection on the GoFundMe page, you'll get the entire, uh, collection of quotes, the 1001 windmills of the mind quotes, plus this extra 100 bonus quotes, right? Um, so we started off with the one about the intergenerational trauma. Okay, Lowald's quote, the goal is to turn ghosts into ancestors. Because right? if it's an ancestor, then there's support there, right? If it's a ghost, it's haunting you, it's bothering you, it wants recognition. The ghost doesn't want to be a ghost. The ghost wants... Grief is healed when it's witnessed. The ghost wants witnessing, right? So Lowald wrote, one of his articles is famous. He wrote a very poetic sort of article. He, he got famous from that. I forgot what it was called, but uh, one of Lowald's, Lowald's articles is uh, um, very poetic in, in, its, in its own right. Not all of his material, but, that, but there's one, one really good article of his. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll dig up the title. Okay, um, quote about psychoanalysis. Okay, about the narrative. We're looking for the whole narrative. People just want only a part of the narrative. That's splitting. Healing, you need the whole narrative. Yeah. Solani's quote about splitting and how the split off parts of ourselves make themselves known like a ghost in the repetition compulsion. Long ago, we would say faith or destiny. Okay, now we're saying repetition compulsion. Right? Self-object, okay, we covered that. Yeah, okay, this whole topic about should I or should I not post uh, uh, the quotes on the psychology of religion. There are some really good quotes. They're very interesting. I'm tempted to do so. I don't have much of an audience, um, but uh, still... I'll think about it. I did sort of leak a little bit of it in this video about it, about how religion promotes the splitting defense mechanism. You know. Let's start off with that movie, uh, Bob and his enlarged amygdala. It, it received, it has a golden windmill of the mind award. That's a good place to start, I think. And if that idea is intriguing, then a good follow-up would be Th Andy Thompson's little tiny booklet called uh, Why We Believe in God or Gods. Right? And he, he has it on YouTube as well, um, a speech about it. Okay, uh, yeah, so this uh, narcissistic self the grandiose self is a defense against the hungry, enraged, empty part self. So there's the split there, right? And we're not aware of the hungry, enraged, empty part self, but it makes itself known in the emotional eating, for example, in our prejudice. You know. yeah. If we project our own hungry, enraged, empty part self um, onto people in living on two dollars a day and uh, and we don't accept our own inner poverty we, we kind of think well we're not interested in seeing it in ourselves then we don't want to see it externalized now sometimes people uh, have identified with the aggressor they actively 
their identity is putting themselves down because they're the mother the mother put the child down now they're the mother they now they externalize themselves onto others so their identity is to put others down because that's what the mother did to them some people put others down to communicate that when they were a baby the, their mother put them down burglar says when they do that they're trying to say that they didn't want to be put down so they're putting others in that down position that i'm okay you're not okay so the mother was okay the child wasn't okay they identify with the mother they reject themselves, they project them, wound itself onto others, and they think, I'm okay, you're not okay. Right? So healing is to move from all of that to, I'm okay, you're okay. Right? That's the healthy development. I'm okay, you're okay. That's the normal, natural, healthy development. When the loving memories with the mother outweigh the frustrating memories. If it didn't happen, we have to do some research and forgive our mothers. The last video talked about that. We have to analyze our childhood analyze our parents' childhood you know if we can get every get all robert bly makes a big point about this you gotta track down your father and interview him and get all the information you can you know he had one touching anecdote he said uh that uh someone he knew uh told robert bly that uh, he approached his father and said dad i want you to know i no longer accept the opinion my mother has of you and that was a huge healing moment right? and uh, robert bly calls that finding the father that was his uh, thing there yeah robert bly's audio that's another windmill another windmill windmills of the mind award was given to uh, robert bly's audio collection and we have a we've issued seven so far robert bly's audio collection bob and his enlarged amygdala and five more okay um interpretation brings the power of the mind into the unconscious mind All right. and uh to think about what was previously unthinkable to uh to find out what was uh, bothering him unnerving him and he can learn that by the non-judgmental matter-of-fact verbalizations of the therapist that matters of the mind that, that are knowable to the therapist, if he, if he can know it, oh, it's normal, it's okay. And he can, he can be more accepting of it, of himself. And um, oh, the unconscious symbolic significance of their acts. Yeah. That's a big one, All right? Okay. We have another win, Golden Windmills of the Mind Award, of course. So the eighth Golden Windmills of the Mind Award goes to the 1955 uh, comic book complete series collection of the of the series of the comic series Psychoanalysis. So 1955, there were four comic book issues, four issues of the comic. Uh, psychoanalysis. The comic series was called Psychoanalysis, but it wasn't a joke. It wasn't for kids or entertainment. It was actually, it was actually a high quality introduction, explanation. More than an, actually, it's more than an introduction. It was a high quality teaching of psychoanalysis using the comic format, and they produced four issue inch, four books, booklets of it. Right? Now these four. Um, they put them together and they reprinted it in hardback and it just came out two years ago i think There's, you can get it online as well uh the publisher's dark horse publishing uh it's called a ec comic archive then you look under psychoanalysis 1955 that book abs absolutely um a golden windmill a golden windmills of the mind award goes to the comic collection uh, psychoanalysis that's a great one and in that collection they talk about some of the symbolic significance of their acts it's very good there's a psychoanalysis of the toxic masculine guy uh, there's a psychoanalysis of the guy who almost became like iago you know there's this guy this freddy guy he was on the verge of becoming iago because the only time 
he got attention. The only time he felt important as a child is when he, was, when he witnessed his parents arguing over him. Otherwise, the father rejected him, the mother was rude to him. But one time he felt relief, one time he felt safe, is when he saw, or when he was able unconsciously to get, his mother and father arguing over him. So he would create some problem, then the mother and father would fight amongst themselves, and he would sit back. And that's the only time he thought he got some kind of attention. Now think about that. That's the seed. That's, that's the seedling for the Iago character. What is the Iago character? He's the guy that sits back and gets everyone against themselves. And he enjoys the show. That's Freddy enjoying the attention of his parents, talking about him. You see, so it's very good, right? So in that book, Psychoanalysis, there are three uh, sessions or episodes with that Freddy character. Very good. There were four episodes with um, a young woman, also very good. Uh, and there are five episodes with Mark Stone. Uh, he's the classic narcissist, uh, toxic, you know, aggressive and uh, rude, and Don Juan, and uh, doesn't care about others. You see, in there, you learn about how the mother used him, and then he uses, and that's why he became a Don Juan, you know. And uh, there are other aspects to it. So that so now we have eight Golden Windmills of the Mind Award. Okay, so I'll just run through them again quickly. Bob and his Enlarged Amygdala comedy series. Okay. Uh, the animation, 30-minute animation of Pierre Gint. Okay. Uh, 1979 by Vadim. I forgot his last name. It's hard to find though, unfortunately. It's not on YouTube anymore. That's the best introduction to Pierre Gint. That's the second one. Robert Bly's audio we mentioned. Okay. Um, Karen Hornice's book, Our Inner Conflicts. Rollo May's book, The Cry for Myth. James Masterson's book, The Search for the Real Self. Okay. Uh, Ursula Le Guin's rendition of the Tao Te Ching. It's an excellent rendition of the great classic book, the Tao Te Ching, the collection of poems. That's seven. And now we're adding the eighth, okay, the psychoanalysis uh, comic series, the complete collection. That's a great, that's a great book. I, I so wish, I so wish they kept that series going. They only, but they got four out. It was good. It's, it's excellent. Those four, those four issues. Um, it sold out instantly, I think, when it came out. People were... In, I'm confused. I don't know. I don't know the backstory of why, why it ended shortly. But it was excellent. It's the best comic series. I, I can't imagine any other comic series being better than that. Not even close. In terms of value, in terms of uplifting the human spirit, in terms of self-understanding. Um, even It even has entertainment value. They even did sort of make it a little bit entertaining. A little dramatic or something but without sacrificing the lesson of it so they did a nice little balance there to pleasing appealing to the entertaining side but not making it to they didn't cross that line where it became nonsense they kept the essence of the lesson it's excellent uh, i really recommend that it's good that they reissued it because no one can find the original copies of it in 1955 you could buy that comic for 10 cents, you know? So the four of them would have been 40 cents. Now you can't get it. But now you can get the whole collection for, I think, for a fair price. Okay, uh, next one here. So we talked about um, the symbolic significance, right? And, um, oh, the one about empathy. The therapist said, um, your father, uh, yeah, you just acknowledge the reality. Yeah, your father did allow your mother to abuse you, and you paid a heavy price for that. Just, just, just to have a therapist say that to somebody. Yeah, you really paid a heavy price for that. You live with PTSD all your life. You paid a heavy price for that. Just to validate that. That's simple validation. Now the person needs soul surgery. <laughs> of course, that's a metaphor for therapy, right? Soul means psyche, okay. psyche, 
psychology means study of the mind, study of the psyche. So healing the psyche. Long ago, therapists were called soul doctors. Um, sometimes it's called philosophical medicine. Okay, we had uh, this quote here from Fred Pine. This, uh, this one was about... Uh, was very similar to what Burglar was saying about the negative magic gesture. The therapist said to the client, you are showing me X, what your childhood was like, by replaying it, by reenacting it, by trying to coax me to play a parent. Now sometimes the client plays the role of a parent, puts the therapist in a devalued child, and then the, then the client degrades the therapist to try to communicate that he was degraded when he was a child. So the therapist offers an interpretation about that. So Burglar is very good about this. He calls it the negative magic gesture. Okay, the, the real self. First, you got to find the possible self. So from the possible self, we get to the real self. Okay, just one about the joke there. And we ended with the, the idea of empathy. If you recognize that everybody is caught in their existential dilemma. Everybody is caught in their existential dilemma, meaning everybody's caught with traumatic memories. Everybody's caught with, uh, well, 50% of the people are caught with an insecure attachment style. The other 50% are maybe, you don't have to worry about them too much because they're healthy, but um, you need them to understand what the other 50% are going through, if that number is correct. Uh, um, some people might say it's higher. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Depends how you define insecure attachment style. Where you, it's kind of blurry, this whole idea, but see, these are approximations, right? All of these theories. But let's just say, let, let's use Burglar's quote. He says, everybody's neurotic. The range is from, at best, you're just mildly neurotic. Mildly neurotic, and then it goes all the way down to, you know, the highly neurotic. Right? So let's just recognize that we're all neurotic, um, that we're all wounded, uh, we're all caught in our existential dilemma. Um, if, if, you, if you're happy in work and love and uh, it's not based on just fueling your narcissism, not that kind of happiness, not just preserving your grandiosity, not that, but from the real self, then that's, that's, the, that's great. Um, but a lot of people don't have that. So let's recognize that a lot of us are looking for that. Let's just recognize that a lot of us are mourning who we could have become, but we don't even know about it. A lot of us are mourning in one form or another who we could have become had we been properly loved right? we had that song by Katie Lee properly loved she, she says um, had she been properly loved right? oh she you know she, she has a song called I was improperly loved yeah I'll think about that maybe maybe there's another golden windmill of the mind award coming up so we'll just stick with the eight for now so we added a new award in this video Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'll just leave it here. And the song, uh, this is a band called Prism. Um, they were popular in the 70s um, with, with uh, the original lead singer, this one here, Ron Tayback. He has some, he's got a very high, high voice. He, I like his, he has a song called Virginia, it's good, and Night to Remember, and uh, a couple of others, yeah. I guess his biggest hit is, uh, is it Spaceship Superstar, is that the one? Um, I think his most rec famous rec pop, in terms of pop commercial success, was a song called Cover Girl, is that the one? About a model or something. I, I like the song Vladivostok, the live version of it. That's a good one. I think, yeah, a couple of others, yeah. 
Okay, so this is uh, the song Open Soul Surgery, originally sung by April Wine, Miles Goodwin. Um, both versions are good. Uh, this is a live version, so I think there won't be a copyright uh, problem. Okay, uh, still no sign of the Blue Jay, but uh, maybe we'll see him. Maybe we'll see the Blue Jay next time. The Bluebird of Happiness. So remember Shirley Temple, if we do the healing work, we'll find the Bluebird of Happiness. So let's uh, have yeah, some good quotes. You know, this bonus material, I, I, I'm a little surprised myself. There's some very good quotes in this bonus material. So this, uh, we have 102, uh, 103, 104 now. Yeah, 103. So this 100 plus quotes in the bonus material, there's some excellent quotes in here. So may I encourage you to consider, uh, you know, making, help, helping, helping, uh, <laughs> help, helping with the campaign to promote awareness of the psychoanalytic approach to healing. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's a valuable uh, angle you know, of understanding the psychoanalytic approach, how we live in two worlds. Right? So yeah, so what I'm trying to say is if you make a donation, uh, you'll get the complete core collection plus this 100 bonus uh, quotes here. Okay, uh, I'll leave it here. So once again, thank you very much. This has been TQ... 1089 to 1103. Bye for now.